Hello and welcome to Pastor Well. I'm Herschel York, Dean of the School of Theology at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky, and pastor of the Buckron Baptist Church in Frankfurt. I'm answering questions and dealing with the issues that pastors face in their ministries, and today I want to specifically deal with the issue of the pastor's marriage. How and why should a pastor cultivate and protect his marriage? Well, I don't want to overlook the obvious. First of all, it's biblical, and it's hard to minister to others when you have this gaping issue in your own life. You know, I can honestly tell you after years as a pastor that outside of the authority of the Word of God itself, the single most significant source of credibility and even authority that I have is in my marriage. I've heard many times throughout the decades that I've both been married and a pastor that people will say something to me to the effect, you know, I want to listen to you because I want what you and your wife have. The reality is people are looking to see if what you're preaching works. And if it's not working in your home, they really don't think you should be exporting it. So you need to focus on keeping your marriage vibrant and godly. Uh, you know, it's, it's biblical. It is precisely God's design in creation. In fact, if you think about it, marriage, uh, the, the Bible begins with a wedding. It ends with a wedding. Jesus' first miracle is at a wedding. I mean, it's a major theme in the Bible. God's design is reflected uh, in the garden when he puts a man and a woman there and he tells them to be fruitful and multiply. So marriage is, first of all, a reflection of God's glory and intentionality in the home. Nowhere should that be more true than in the pastor's home. It's also a reflection of God's design in the gospel. Of all the relationships that God could have chosen to say, this is what my love for my church is like. He, he could have said like a mother's love for her child. But in Ephesians 5, he said that husbands, you're to love your wives as Christ loved the church. Uh, wives, you're, you're to respect your husbands and submit to him as the church does Christ. And so when we cultivate our marriages, we're reflecting God's glory in the gospel, but also God's glory in the consummation of the age. In the book of Revelation, the union of Jesus and his people is portrayed as that great wedding uh, that we're going to be united with him. So a pastor who has a good marriage is reflecting all of that, God's glory in, his, in the garden in creation, in the gospel, in his love for the church, in glory in the consummation. So for God's glory... You need to cultivate and protect your marriage, first of all, because God demands it and he deserves it, but secondly, for your own happiness and your own holiness. Marriage certainly is a sanctifying uh, institution. I mean, God gave it to us as a means of holiness. Now, there's the obvious aspect of it uh, in the physical relationship in marriage that is the proper expression of our sexuality in that intimate way. And that indeed does contribute toward our holiness. I think a, a well-regulated physical relationship between a husband and a wife, and especially between a pastor and his wife, is a sanctifying thing. But frankly, it's, it's sanctifying in a lot of ways. Uh, by the selflessness that is required in marriage, I'm learning how to give myself every day. And if I'm not willing and able to give myself for my wife at home, I'm probably not going to be that willing and able to give myself in the right way for my church. Uh, also, my wife, man, she is my most faithful friend and critic. I mean that in the best possible sense. Uh, she's the one who's uh, opinion I trust the most. Man, I, I trust her opinion about my preaching, about my leadership, about my interaction with people. God put her in my life to sharpen me, to help me be more like Christ. And just in the iron sharpening iron process of marriage, it's 
helped me grow in holiness and sensitivity to people and empathy. I mean, I had an, I still have an awful lot of rough edges, but I have fewer because Tanya Sharp York has worn them down quite a bit. And that's a great thing. The, I don't get to be alone. I don't get to be self-centered. By nature, I'm an introvert, and I could very easily just sort of be a study rat. Being married to an extrovert and a people person like Tanya has been a, a compelling force in my life that I need to grow and be more like her. You know, the, the Lord is so good in the way he puts us together with people who compliment us. So you need to grow in holiness in your marriage, but also in happiness. I mean, marriage is given to us uh, to be a source of joy. Uh, in the same way that we have a joy in our relationship with Christ, we have a joy in our relationship with one another. I'll let you in a little secret. Churches will come and go. It's a good thing if you love your church now, but you know you're, you can get another church. That church that loves you right now could fire you next year. That's just a, a part of being a pastor. But your wife is going to be with you through thick or thin. At least that's the goal. That's the desire. And so you need to cultivate your relationship with her because that needs to be primary over your relationship with the church. And if you get that out of order, it's going to be hurtful to you and to your ministry. So cultivate your relationship with your wife so that you both have this mutual joy and respect. I like having someone that's going through life with me just to enjoy, enjoy the sunset, enjoy traveling together, enjoy a meal together. So I want to cultivate that relationship so there's always a joy in it. When I get up the first moments of the day that we're together, we try and make those very, very positive moments. When we're together at the end of the day, we don't dump on each other. We don't, we don't talk about all the terrible things that happened in our day or who we're upset with. We always make those pleasant moments. We go to bed together. I'm not going to make that a hard and fast rule, like somehow you're ungodly if you don't do that. But I will tell you that for years, I used to stay up and work at night, and I think I made a mistake. I like going to bed with my wife. I can get up as early as I want. If I want to get up at 4 o'clock and study, I can do that. But it's good for us to say, hey, what time do you want to go to bed? Uh, and we get in bed together. We have those moments together before we both drift off to sleep. So we cultivate these moments of sharing and encouraging one another and enjoying each other and saying kind things to each other. And, and sort of the negative stuff is off limits. We choose when we're going to deal with those things. Finally, really for your own credibility, you need to invest in your marriage because you just really can't preach to other people when they're looking at your marriage and saying, that's not working at home. Your spiritual physical, emotional investment, it's going to pay dividends. You know, years ago, 1973, I think it was, Walmart had their initial public offering of stock, and it was $16 for one share of Walmart stock. Let's imagine that you bought 100 shares of Walmart stock in 1973. You would have invested $1,600. And if you held on to that, with all of its uh, sp splittings and growth during the years, uh, give or take a million, I think today it would be worth about, I'm going to say $18 million. Now, I was alive in 1973. I even had $1,600 in 1973 as a 13-year-old. I'd saved up that much money. But I don't have $18 million today, and you know why? Because I didn't invest it. You can't get a return on an investment you don't make. If you want to have a joyful marriage, you're really going to have to invest. Uh, you're going to have to give it time and attention. You can't let your wife feel like she's somehow a second place to the church. You love the Lord Jesus first and then love your wife and your, your children and then your church. Get that in the right order. Uh, you want to have balance in your life and all those things, but your wife is going to be uh, the greatest evidence that the gospel you preach in the pulpit works in your home. So make that investment. You'll get the dividend. A few years ago, a friend of mine called and he said, Dr. York, I have to confess something to you. He said, I love my ministry. I really enjoy my church. 
He said, and, and I love my wife, but I really just don't feel like I need her. I, you know, I'm, we have an okay home, nothing's wrong, but he said, I get up in the morning thinking about my church and preaching, and I really don't think about my wife. Can you give me some advice? I said, you, you bet I can. You need to go to your wife, get on your knees in front of her, and beg for her forgiveness. It sort of shocked him. And I said, man, this is, this is no small thing you're doing. You're thinking that just because you're not committing adultery that you're okay. And, but I'm warning you that if you persist in that attitude, Satan is going to bring some real destruction on your life and your home. Trust me on this. You need to keep a flame of love and passion in your heart for your wife. And I would tell you the same thing that I told my friend that day, that if you've allowed your marriage to get stale while you're studying sermons and you're teaching classes and you're visiting the sick and dealing with all the stuff you deal with on a daily basis, but you're allowing the primary human relationship in your life to grow cold, repent. Ask God to give you the grace to be the kind of husband and leader to her that makes her glad she married a man that is now in ministry. So God will use you in a much greater way publicly when privately you're devoted to him through your love and affection to your wife. I trust this has been a blessing to you, and I'll see you again next time on Pastor Well.